We have one more person coming in. Okay. Hello, my name is Nick Baptiste. I'm the editor of the Valley Springs News, and I'd like to welcome everybody to our candidates tonight. I'm going to be your moderator for tonight. And I'd like to uh, introduce our two candidates for District 1 Supervisor. To my immediate left is Zara McDaniel. And to my far left is... <laughs> Hello, Gary. <laughs> hey, Nick, how are you? I'm doing good. Gary Toffinelli. You got all this, right? I did, yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll talk about this tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to get fined at Rotary. I can see that one coming. <laughs> We're going to try to keep things simple tonight and move very quickly. After the introductions of each of the candidates, they'll have three minutes for an opening statement. And then I've got a few questions for them. After that, we're going to have a little break. And during the break, we have boxes to my side and then to the back there and paper. You can ask the candidates some questions. I'll go through those questions during the break, try to weed out basically the ones that are redundant. And uh, then we'll inform again and we'll get to your questions for the candidates. Uh, hopefully we'll wrap it up around 8 o'clock and the candidates will probably stay a little bit longer and mingle and talk to you with um, you know, any of your individual concerns. We'd like the questions tonight to be issues oriented, questions that both candidates can answer, not questions on a personal nature. I hope that everybody can understand those ground rules. Um, the candidates will have three minutes for their opening statements, two minutes for the questions. We have a timer over here. He will let the candidates know when they're getting close to the end of their time limit. And um, then we'll uh, proceed to the next questions. The candidates will do it in alternate fashion, so they'll be the first one to answer a question, and they'll also be the last one to answer a question every other turn. So it's not like they're always leading off. So without any more from me, I'd like to uh, begin with Zero. She won the coin toss, and she has the first opening statement. I said I, I, said I uh, probably should buy a lottery ticket. I won this, won this toss. Anyway, I really want to thank all of you for coming out. It's a weeknight and a work night for many of you, and I uh, appreciate that. Um, there's a few things that I'd like you to know about me and why I'm running for supervisor. I'm a longtime resident of Calaveras County. My husband is a retired police lieutenant from Lodi Police Department. I have two grown children who are adult, or the adult children who no longer live in the county, unfortunately, but are thankfully productive citizens. I can be a full-time uh, supervisor for, for District 1 in Calaveras County. And I can and I will represent all areas of District 1 because I can honestly say that they are my communities. And I understand what the problems are for Calaveras County and I want to be part of that solution. I've been an active participant in the communities of San Andreas and Valley Springs for a very long time before I decided to run for supervisor. Because I'm a 24-year business owner in Calaveras County, in District 1, I know the community through my customers and other business leaders. Because I've spent the last nine years on the Calaveras Unified School District Board of Trustees, and I've worked with parent groups in every school, dis in, every school in District 1, I know the needs of kids, and I know the needs of their families. Because I've been a leader in community planning for the past four years, I see the need for planning and vision. You know, if we fail to plan, then we might as well just plan to fail. Planning for prosperity is the positive path to our future, in my view. Because I've served on the Calaveras County Grand Jury for two years, one is its four-person I understand how Calaveras County works. I know my communities, including its people, its problems, and I know all of those wonderful things that we can celebrate also here in Calaveras County. Our next district supervisor must have credibility to build trust with all stakeholders. And it's going to take trust 
to bring people together to find the solutions that we need. I've been reaching out for a very long time to build that trust with, with community groups. Um, I've reached out to developers, I've reached out to business people, to community, um, community groups all over Calaveras County, elected officials, department heads, service districts, our water and our sewer, our fire departments. And I think this is important to, in building that trust. If you want to know what kind of supervisor I'm going to be in the future, I ask you to look at my past record. Values, leadership, and experience I think are important things for a supervisor to bring to this job. I believe in personal responsibility, I believe in fiscal responsibility, and I believe in being a good citizen. And I'm, I'm doing my best to, to um, get elected for this job by meeting as many people I can and building that kind of trust. Thank you. Hello everybody, I'm glad you all came. Um, looks like we have almost a full house here. This is the last in the series of Canada's nights that we have. Uh, Zero and I have been doing these since April of this year, and, and there was another member here that didn't make it to the runoff. So we've gone to quite a few of these things, and we're down the home stretch here. Um, and uh, there's still a little bit of work to do. I'm still going door to door. I will be going door to door until uh, the election day. November 4th is election day. I will be out there um, the night before on November 3rd. Um, a little bit about myself, for those of you that are here and maybe don't know uh, a lot about me. Um, I've been married to my wife, Denise, who's sitting in the back back here uh, for 36 years. We were high school sweethearts. My son, John, my youngest son, John, is sitting next to her. Um, he graduated from Calaveras High and lives here. He lives um, off Highway 26. Um, my other son, Gary, my oldest son, uh, he lives in Hawaii. He's very lucky. So we're very lucky when we want to go to Hawaii because we just have to pay for a plane ticket to get there. Uh, we have five grandkids. And, and, and both of my kids, um, in, in, just I don't know why, but they both married Hawaiian girls. They're both married for some reason. I don't know why. I guess I don't know. Um, but I've owned the company, uh, my company, with my wife for the last 16 years. Uh, I'm a steel fabricator and erector. I hold a C-51 contractor's license. Um, I've been a union iron worker for, since I was 18 years old. Um, I've actually only worked for two companies. Uh, the other company I worked for was a large steel fabricator, and I started at the bottom. I, I went to a vocational trade school, and, and I, I, I went through it, and it was six months, eight hours a day, and um, I got through it, and I was a certified welder, and I went here, and they hired me, but I didn't end up welding. I started at the very bottom, sweeping floors, and went all the way up. I worked there 21 years. The last five years, I was running it, over 250 employees. Um, I took management classes and courses, and so I've been in business management for over 21 years in, in large companies. So I, I understand the, the schematics and, and how to run a business and how to keep it afloat. Um, but enough about me. You're here tonight to ask questions, to help you decide on how you're going to vote. I'm here to answer them to the, best, to the best of my ability and the best that I can, and I will do that. And I will answer them straightforward for you tonight. Um, but I'm also here to ask you for your vote. And hopefully I can give the answers that, that you want to hear that the way that you feel that I can tr you can trust me with your vote when I'm in office. I will serve the public with integrity and honest and availability, and I will do what I do best. I will work very hard. I worked very hard all my life to get where I am, and I'll do the same. I'm willing to step down from my, com my company and let my son take over. He's been in training for the last 13 years. He started at the bottom like I did. He did not start in the office. He went out in the shop, and he knows the business from the bottom up. And I'm going to step down. 
I'll be 55 on November 17th, and he will take over my company. I'll be there for guidance and help him out, but I will be a full-time supervisor and work hard for the county and the public, not only the people in District 1, but the people in the entire county, Calaveras County. And I will work for the betterment of Calaveras County because I love Calaveras County and a lot of people that see me have came, I've gone to their doors, my shirts, all of my campaign shirts, they right on, right over my heart. I love Calaveras County. Um, I have been here for 17 years with my family. My grandfather was chief of police in Amador County in Jackson. He was there for 20 years. My father was a police officer over there in Jackson. Um, I grew up in that area. So I'm very familiar with this whole area. Actually, Amador County was, uh, I got a red card, so. Uh, Gary, thank you very much. Go ahead and stay there, you have the first question. This past summer, the Sheriff's Department closed the Valley Springs sub substation for budgetary reasons. Smaller communities such as Moak Hill, Comanche, Mountain Ranch, West Point, and Arnold still have substations. Do you believe it is important to have a sheriff substation in Valley Springs, and if so, what will you do as District 1 supervisor to reopen the substation? I believe that public safety is number one. I don't believe any budget cuts that may be coming should be in, at the expense of public safety. I, I believe in the sheriff's office. I, I know that they have uh, a limited budget over there and have been and have had a limited budget. Um, I, I'm, I know that they did close the substation. Um, I'm not in favor of closing any other substation. I will work diligently to find ways if we need grants, any type of thing out there that we can do to get the funds to keep the substations open. I also believe that the, that the sheriff's state office um, in the county has an adequated, um, 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 excuse me, lots of words here, but uh, an adequated um, um, system of, of of uh, response with dispatch, um, communication systems, excuse me, um, that there are some areas like some of your telephones here in the county that they, they, they cannot have contact with dispatch or any other units. So there could be times when, when somebody's drunk driving or somebody's, they need to pull over. Um, they cannot get in contact. So what do you do? Um, do you just keep following until you get to a point where where you can have communications and maybe put jeopardizing or putting other people, their safety on the line if these people are drunk and they're driving and swerving all over? You don't know if it's night, if it's dark, whether you're pulling up to them, whether what's, what, how many people in the car, what they have in the car, or what you're going to. So I, I think that that's one of the things that we really need to work on in this county. Um, is to upgrade the, the communication systems that the Sheriff's Department has. Um, I, I tell you, I, I will look very hard, I will work very hard to find ways to get this substation open, like say through grants, um, anything that I can find to do. Thank you. This past summer, the Sheriff's Department closed the Valley Springs substation for budgetary reasons. Smaller communities still have their substations. Do you believe it is important for the Sheriff, do you believe it is important to have a Sheriff substation in Valley Springs, and if so, what will you do as District 1 supervisor to reopen the substation? Um, yes, I do. Um, having my, actually my husband and my both my children are in some form of law enforcement. My daughter's a, one of those CSI people. San Diego, and my son is in the Coast Guard in a um, in a in a uh, law enforcement capacity. Um, I believe that that uh, public that public safety is probably one of the most fundamental things that citizens deserve to have, um, along with adequate fire protection. Um, I actually have had conversation recently with a, uh, a local citizen here about this very subject, and I think because. The west end of the county is growing the fastest. We have, this is the last place that we don't need a substation for uh, law enforcement. Um, I spoke with um, District Superintendent Jim Frost who, who, um, of the Calish Unified School District, and um, we've already 
um, said that our, the Old Valley Springs office can be used as a substation if the Sheriff's Department would like to have that. It's available. So we haven't heard whether or not that's going to be an acceptable place, but if it isn't, I certainly will um, work very hard to find other space available. Thank you. Sarah, you're going to take the next question. The rainy season is approaching and Cosgrove Creek remains full of debris and vegetation. If elected, would you and how would you cut through the federal red tape and take some of the preventive measures immediately that are needed to lessen the flooding potential along Cosgrove Creek? Well, this is a, this is, this is a situation that shouldn't have taken this long to, to deal with. I, it's hard to understand why the bureaucracies are so difficult to deal with. Um, as I was doing my walking out there on, uh, I believe it's Huckleberry, um, there wasn't a person on, these, on this end of the road that didn't have that as part of their concerns that, that their um, homes weren't going to be flooded this winter. Now we don't know what kind of a winter we're going to have, but if it's a winter that we should have and that we all want more water, uh, it could be a real problem. I think that we need to um, be proactive. I think we need to be like dripping water until they tell us to just shut up. We shouldn't just wait for them to, the, the um, fishing game and, and uh, the Army Corps of Engineers to get back to us. I think we need to be in their face because this is a chronic problem that's been, that's been over many, many years. And I know there's some plans of you know, raising the road on Hogan Dam Road and and some other measures, but we need to we need to act. You know, I'm action oriented. Once it takes me some time to figure things out because I like to get input from the whole, all all the way around. But once I do, I want it done yesterday. So that would probably be the first thing I would do is meet with Corps of Engineers, Fish and Game, our um, our CAO, and others in uh, county leadership, and find out. What has taken so long? Gary, do you need me to repeat the question? No. You know, I, I've done some projects with the Corps of Engineers, so I, I know a couple people up there. And what, what I think needs to be done, and what I would do um, as your supervisor in this district, I would lead a coalition of people directly to the door of Fish and Game and to the Corps of Engineers and demand that they do something. It's been long enough over here. Um, I would keep doing that. I would form that coalition every week if that's what it took. Because I work with the Corps and some, they have a tremendous amount of projects, a tremendous, an unlimited amount of projects. And it seems like anything else, the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, and that's what you have to do. You have to keep going over there, and you take the homeowners with you, every one of them that can find the time to go with you, and you lead them over there, and they're going to listen to you, and we're going to get it resolved. There's also a, a flood control program that CCWD and the county and the Corps is involved in um, down further on that creek where there's some retaining, there's a, a program on the books to for some retaining ponds and some flood control relief further down. Um, but I think the whole creek is even worse now with the overgrowth and the debris in it than it was the year that it flooded two years ago because there's been nothing done to it since. And it's just it's just an, an embarrassment over there uh, that that just seems to keep going and being pushed aside and nobody says anything in the county and nobody's done anything up there as far as getting some type of coalition together to go down there to Sacramento and get it done. And that's what I would do, the first thing I would do. Thank you. Do you have the next question? You've been asked a number of times about the Trinitas proposal. Do you believe there is a win-win situation for the developer and those property owners opposed to the project? And if so, can you outline your ideas to satisfy both parties? Well, this is, a, this is an issue in the county that sadly got to the point where, where it is. It's a very emotional, very, very emotional issue on both sides. 
um, a win-win situation. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I think um, it's, it's gone through the process, and I, I believe that the Planning Commission is scheduled November 6th to go out for a site visit. Um, I honestly believe it doesn't matter when it gets through the Planning Commission. Um, it's going to, no matter which way they go, it's going to be appealed. It's going to end up at the Board of Supervisors. Um, at that point, um, the, the only thing the Board of Supervisors can do, and I, I believe there's going to be a lot of closed doors uh, sessions with legal counsel, and they're going to have to bring in maybe another, some other land um, uh, counsel experts to give them guidance on, on how to decide on that issue. And I, I truly believe that it doesn't matter which way it goes that at that point either, that there'll probably be some type of litigation. I've offered earlier uh, to mediate, uh, be a mediator for both sides, at least get both sides. They don't have to be in the same room. They can be, on, they can be in two different buildings. Um, but I think something needs to be done um, legitimately by both sides. Um, I've been involved in arbitrations. I've been, I've been involved in lawsuits and construction. I, I've been uh, all of those above. And uh, the, the only way you can begin to resolve any of it is to get both sides to at least agree to have somebody mediate between them. That's the initial starting process. And, and at least have an idea of what the other side is willing to do. Um, and again, I offer my, my assistance to that if either one of them feel that, that I would be a good mediator or I would certainly help find one that they both agreed upon uh, to get at least a, a start on it. Thank you. This is a very emotional issue, and I have to say it should never have gotten to this point. You've got neighbor pitted against neighbor, citizen against citizen, and that's a formula for, for failure. We have some, what I would, I would acknowledge, some systemic problems at the county level that we need to work on and uh, identify and fix. But I would say that um, in terms of Trinitas, I've, the, the revised um, draft EIR is out. And on the 29th was the last day for public comment. I haven't had a chance to read those public comments yet, but I'm looking forward to doing that. But I would, I would, um, I would like to see pe all people refrain from making comments on this until the process has gone through. Process is important, and if we hijack processes on the way through, then this is where we end up in this kind of a mess. <clears throat> All sides have, may or may not have valid views, but they need to be heard. All sides need to be heard. And all people in leadership need to be listening. I'm not sure at this point how, if there's, if, 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 I don't know if we can have a win-win in this at this point. But I know one thing is that County leaders need to make sure that this never happens again, that we never get to a point where we aren't following the laws, rules, ordinance, and policies of our county. And if we have deficiencies in those policies, rules, ordinances, and uh, what was the other one? Um, laws. Um, we need to identify those now. We need to draw a line in the dirt, fix them and make sure that we're not in this position again. Because you know what? Who's going to win and who's going to lose? The citizens of Calaveras County are going to lose. And I think that's all I have to say. It makes me upset. Do you believe the Board of Supervisors made a wise decision on the Rogers Media billboard request? And if not, what would you have done differently? <laughs> Well, 
I have to, in terms of um, public disclosure, <laughs> say that I was someone that actually um, went to the Board of Supervisors, I wrote letters, and I spoke to this issue. I think the misconception about this is that those of us who oppose the billboards don't care about property rights. We do care about property rights. The only thing we asked is because we're in the middle of a community plan update, because we're in the middle of a general plan update, because Title 17, as it relates to billboards, have not been updated for many years, we asked for a postponement until we could address at least the Title 17. So we could have some standards that have to do with what kind of a billboard will fit into the authentic gold rush history that we have. What do you see when you first come into Calaveras County from any place, any place? You see those gold carts. And you know what those gold carts represent to me? They represent that we care about our gold rush history. Now tourism is a big, big part of our economic base in Calaveras County. And those of us who oppose the billboards felt that the type of billboard that was being proposed was inconsistent with our, 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 our gold rush history and would economically hurt our tourism. I don't think the Board of Supervisors um, knew how to, to deal with this issue, but um, I think maybe it's time that we could maybe meet with the landowner and figure out some way to, to have them see this side of the coin. And I think that what happened at the Board of Supervisors by putting the restrictions that they did on it uh, has given us some time to do that. I certainly would hate to see this go to litigation. I was totally offended by the reaction of the um, Rogers media and their threats to the county. I think that was not a fair way to approach it. But um, I think we have hope. We can still move forward and I think we can find a way to work with each other. You know, I, this, this issue, um, I don't know if anybody's seen the PEG TV. Um, we did a slot, Zero and I did last week on PEG TV, um, and we ended it on this issue. And then her and I stayed at the studio for at least 15 or 20 minutes uh, going over our views of, of this particular issue. Um, and then I saw an article in the, or I guess a letter to the editor about one of the property owners in there uh, in the Calaveras Enterprise uh, yesterday's paper um, on this particular thing um, and um, I met with Kevin and Mr. Rogers on the steps of the county courthouse um, the, the first day that it was up for review at the Planning Commission and, and I told them that, that I felt they needed to listen to public outcry. And I told them personally that I was opposed to them, that I drove that highway every day. Um, but I understood the law. And, and the law, in, in, where they're zoned at, and what the law says as far as ordinances, um, they're within their rights. And if we don't like that, that we have the right to change the law and we need to change that law. And I think that's what the legal counsel that, that the Board of Supervisors had in closed sessions specifically told them. If you categorically deny it, then you're tantamount to breaking the law yourself. And you're gonna bring a lawsuit. And that is gonna cost money to the taxpayers. And I'm telling you right now, the burden on taxpayers, us, all of us here, with the bailouts and what's happening with the economy right now, we can't afford another lawsuit in paying our tax dollars. We would, if we lose that, we would have to pay not only our legal counsel, but his legal counsel and any penalties and fees that are imposed upon us 
for our wrong and his loss of income during that time. There's a lot of legal things that need to be dealt with on that, and that's why they voted. They didn't categorically deny him, but they put conditions on his use permit that kind of limited what he could do over there. And that's what they got the decision. That's why they made the decision. And I'm telling you, if we don't want billboards here, then we need to change the laws, and we need to go before the Board of Supervisors, and we need to do what it takes to change those laws so they can't be put up there. That's what we need to do. Thank you. So if you were elected, will you push to rewrite the sign ordinance, and what would you like to see in the revised sign ordinance? Would I push to revise the sign ordinance, and what would I like to see put in there? Yes. Yes, I would. That would be one of the first things that I would try and get done in there. And I would like to see no billboards put up there. But I'm not sure that is legally possible, too, because I think some of the laws that are written in the state, when you have zones, could prohibit some of that. The possibility that that could be, I'd have to look into that. I'd have to talk to legal counsel. But I would like to see no billboards. I was on a grand jury in the early 2000s that investigated these particular ones that are right down at the end of the street right here. We were trying to get rid of them, too. We wrote a report on it. It was virtually impossible because it was grandfathered in, and it was given through the railroad, and the railroad had authority in Caltrans. It infringes on Caltrans easement, but Caltrans couldn't do anything about it because the railroad had more power and more authority than they did. And so they're there. And the only way that they're going to disappear is if the owners of those billboards quit making money on them, which I don't think they're going to run out of people from outside this county willing to not pay for ads there. So thank you. I can repeat it. If elected, will you push for a rewrite of the sign ordinance, and what would you like to see in the revised sign ordinance? Well, you probably guessed from my last answer that the answer would be yes. Like I said before, the purpose is not to deprive the property owner of the ability to make income. The purpose of my actions, I can only speak for myself, was to give us the ability to update our Title 17 as it relates to billboards and create a standard that is fitting with our authentic gold rush landscape and history. And I think we can come up with some very attractive signs that would fit into the landscape, would not be a detraction. I don't know if you understand what we're talking about. We're talking about it's either a 25-foot high or 30-foot high, 25 or 30-foot wide billboard, stainless steel, I believe they said, with catwalks and lighting, three of them, right next to each other. Now, if that fits in with our authentic gold rush landscape and history, I've been asleep. But yes, I would work to, and that's one of the things I talked about earlier about those systemic problems at the county level. This is one of them. It's been identified. Now we need to address it, fix it, so we don't run into the same thing over and over and over again. And I think, again, it's very important to our economic future, our economic base, which is our tourism, to protect those scenic highways that tourists love to come and see and that we all love to see. And we still can, the property owner can still make money from his property. Last month it came out that the county has been slow in completing the necessary paperwork to obtain $1.2 million in proposition funding for parks and recreation projects. The county administrative office would like to use 10% of those funds to hire someone to shepherd these projects through the funding process. 
What are your thoughts on this plan and the diversion of money from recreation needs to staff? Well, I've always been a passionate and proponent of parks. I think it's hard to say you have a town without parks. When I first heard that the Board, the board of Supervisors um, created the Park Commission, I was so excited. I started going to those meetings. And because I started going to those meetings, I, it took me, a, you know, it takes you a while to kind of figure out what's going on. But I'll tell you what, we have five very passionate, dedicated park commissioners, one from each district, and they really care about what they're doing. We have all this money, Prop 40 money, and I don't want to take all the credit, but I will take some of the credit because money was when money was going to be left and not used. So I asked, can can anybody use it? So we worked very hard with Calaveras Unified because Calaveras Unified School District is really a big part of the park system in Calaveras County because of the schools, because of their playgrounds, because of their football fields, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, soccer. So we were able to grab $35,000 of that money for San, a new playground in San, San Andreas Elementary. And I, I guess I should be proud or maybe embarrassed, I don't know. I used to play on that equipment and it's still there. <laughs> so we need new equipment at San Andreas Elementary. Now we're gonna get it. And we also got $15,000 for a shape structure for the kids at San Andreas Elementary. Just this last week, we were able to put together a grant for West Point um, Ballpark up at the West Point School because this money was either going to be used or lost. So in terms of what the question is really about, how do I feel about using the 10% of the money? It's, I, I'm in favor of, I mean I don't like to take 10% of the money and, and, and use it for administration, but if we don't, then we're going to lose the money. So we have a lot of really great projects, over a million dollars worth of projects in parks going into Calaveras County, and that's because you have the Park Commission and, and those five members that, um, that have worked so hard to make it what it is. Am I willing to spend 10% of 1.2 million to make up to make the difference because the county was slow in in asking or filing the paperwork for the funding. That's the question. Yeah. Well, as a businessman, I, I would say if that's the case that you need to do, you need to spend money to make money, and we don't have anybody actively doing that in the county. That yes, I would I would spend the 10 percent. I would authorize the 10 percent spent in the position to, to um, write the necessary paperwork to receive the funds. Yes, I, I think that only makes good business sense. Um, I don't, that's, that's all I have to say about it. Okay, forward. Gary, which one supervisor do you believe you're most like-minded with? <laughs> well, this, this is a repeat question from last week. This, this is uh, it's the same for, I want to know how many people were there last week? <laughs> John, this is your question. So <laughs> uh, for the people here. <laughs> um, what one supervisor, that current supervisor or any supervisor, past, <laughs> present, or? A supervisor who you think you'll be working with on the board, I assume. Well, I'll be working with all other four supervisors, and, and I have two current supervisors that are actually um, supporting my campaign, and I won't name the two, but two of them um, that you would not think would come together based on their performances and the way they are when they're um, on the board, up at the board, or even in public. Um, but I do have two of them supporting my campaign, two active ones. Um, I have two past ones that are actively you know, supporting my campaign. Um, and I have uh, the widow and daughter of a former one that are actively um, supporting my campaign. Uh, so to pick one out, either past or present, I, I can't. I, I'm a businessman and I, I 
built my business um, by my standards and how I felt it should be. Um, I, I've done that without anybody's help, um, and I will I will be that way on the board as your supervisor. Um, that's the way I am, as my wife can attest to that, and my son. Uh, that I, I will certainly work with them. I'm not saying I will not work with anybody. I will work with anybody that's on that board, and I will work with anybody on any of the, the department heads, and I will work with anybody in any of the committees to actively pursue um, whatever we are trying to get done. experience uh, working on other boards. As I said before, Calvary Unified School District trustee, we have five members. I can work with anybody. I like people. I can even work with you if you don't agree with me or if I don't agree with you. Because really, it's not about me. It's about our community and what the citizens believe in, what they want, what they need. Um, I like, personally, I like all of our current supervisors. Um, I don't know <clears throat> if any of them support me or not support me. It doesn't matter. But um, I'm looking forward to working with them. I've made it part of my quest here to, to understand the issues that are going on in all five districts because, you know, when you vote on something, you're not just voting in District 1, because whatever you vote in District 1 affects District 4, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and vice versa. So I would hope that all supervisors are thinking about District 1 when they're voting, and it's not just about their citizens or their people. With the recent crackdown on signs, the moratorium, and troubles in the Community Development Agency, County government lately has been labeled as anti-business, anti-development, anti-growth. Do you believe there is some truth to these perceptions? And if so, if elected, how would you be an agent to change these perceptions? I think it's nonsense. I don't think there's anyone that I know that's no growth. I think that um, being a business person in Calaveras County for the last 24 years, I have business in San Andreas and the Greater Valley Springs area, I can only talk personally, but I welcome some more retail. Might help people to stay in the county, spend their tax dollars here, and maybe come into my store. What was the rest of the question? Which part didn't you get? I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, I'll read it from the beginning then. With the recent crackdown on signs, the moratorium, and troubles in the Community Development Agency, County government lately has been labeled as anti-business, anti-development, and anti-growth. Do you believe there is some truth in these perceptions? And if so, if elected, how would you be an agent to change these perceptions? Well, I, to, to continue on with that, I, I think I have been an agent all along. I, like I, I told you earlier, I've been reaching out to all of these stakeholders for, for longer than I've been trying to run for supervisor and bring people together so we can actually move forward. Like I said, I, I like to research things out. I like to see all sides, but once I do make a decision, I want to move on it. And it's frustrating to me as a business person to watch what's going on in the county. How embarrassing. How embarrassing is that to other counties to see the way we behave in this county? I, I will be one who, who, who will work with other people, because I have worked with other people. As I told you before, judge me <coughs> on my past record and you'll see how I will behave in the future. Nick, one more time, please. One more time, okay. I'm not sure I understood that. Okay. With the recent crackdown on business signs, the moratorium, and troubles in the Community Development Agency. County government lately has been labeled as anti-business, anti-development, and anti-growth. Do you believe there is some truth in these perceptions? And if so, if elected, how would you be an agent to change these perceptions? 
Well, there certainly is perceived out there. Uh, you talk to a lot of people um, in, in all aspects of life, and they, 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 they perceive that the county outside of it is perceived as a no growth and a no business atmosphere type county. Um, and some of the things that they point to certainly looks that way. I'm not in favor of a CDA, and I've said that many times throughout this whole course of, of, of meetings and talking to people or whatever. I don't think the type of construction that's done in this county um, would warrant that position. That money could go better spent in planning another planner or, or, or other places um, than that department head. Um, I think um, that larger counties or larger municipalities um, would warrant it that have large construction developments of thousands of homes that we're going in before the economic times we're experiencing right now, um, and large uh, commercial projects that you would need somebody to oversee to make sure that it goes through planning and it goes through the building permit process and inspection um, smoothly. Um, but. Uh, here in this county, I don't, I don't think we need that. Uh, what would I do? I, I, I would, I'm in favor of an economic development agency, and I've said that since the beginning, too. Um, I think we need somebody like Amador County has, or even Tuolumne County has, um, that, that finds SBA loans, writes SBA loans for companies that are trying to expand or retain what they have, or move into um, their county over there, in either county. Um, they also help the process when the company comes to them and says, we want to expand, we want to buy this piece of property, we, we want to move our, our headquarters over there. They help them go through the planning process, they help them go through the building process, they help them go through the SBA loan process, they guide them through every step of the way to get them to the, where they need to go to, to see their vision, developed into what they want. Um, we don't have anything like that here. We did at one time, and I've met with a, a couple people, uh, Kathy Zancanella was part of it, and um, um, uh, Dixon Collins was part of a former, uh, C, actually it was an economic development um, um, a commission that was here in the county, and they did some great work. There's, the perception there was that that they didn't do anything, and it was it wasn't worth it. But but they 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 had a good leader at one time, and then the last few years, when they finally started getting the fruits of what they were doing coming together, the leader left, and they were without a good leader. And I think that's what we need here. We need somebody in that that department or that agency. Um, that is a good, strong leader and knows how to work with people and knows what, what it takes to get SBA loans and knows what it takes to get through the planning and building departments. Thank you. One more question and then we'll take a little break and everybody can uh, submit questions and we'll get on with the uh, second part of the candidates tonight. Last question uh, for now is, what are your feelings about Caltrans and the county's plans to eventually install traffic signals at the intersection of highways 12 and 26? Do you believe there are better alternatives? Well, co coincidentally, um, I've been going door to door, and I think some of the people that are here that, that I've knocked on their doors, and, and I, I brought that, I've been bringing that fact up to them, because right out in front of here, of this is where we're meeting right now, is Daphne Street. And Daphne Street um, is being paved over and widened for bike lanes. And, and most of the people in the neighborhood here had no idea what was happening. There was a, a hastily made, uh, put together meeting by the county here one night, and it wasn't very well posted. It wasn't, back, I think the only place it was posted on um, was, was the pine tree had it for a day, and it was posted on the county website. Well, a lot of people in this area don't have computers, and they don't go to, to the, to, I don't want to say they don't go to the pine tree, but they probably don't go there every day or, or what have you. Um, and they certainly don't always go to check off what's going on at the county government's, uh, their, their website. Um, uh, that's what's going to happen, I think, with this traffic light. I'm trying to pass the word now that that is on the books and that's going to happen unless we want to change it. 
and that's what we need to do we need to have town hall meetings here and send out messages to people get it in the mail let them know notify them what's going on and then get them in the call and then we can get a consensus and work together on what people want if do they really want a traffic light here is that what we truly want or do we want other things done there was a roundabout talked about um, the Bill Claudino, you know, the current supervisor, and, and put that down saying it would take out too much. He, 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 he was at one meeting that we had about it. Um, I, I, would, I don't envision seeing, I, I know we have traffic problems right there in the mornings and in the afternoons with the school. I, I'm aware of it. Th those, are, those are growing pains. We, we've grown quite rapidly here over the course of the last five or six years. Um, I'm not in favor of it. Uh, I, I think we can look for an alternative. I think if even if you put that there and you take out the Century 21 tri dam building and you take out part of the little square that's out here, when you're in, in whatever they're going to do to to make accommodate for it, um, then they're talking about a bypass. So if we get a bypass two or five years down the line, and we've got this traffic light here that's going to be absolutely worthless. We spent all this money. I think the $800,000 or $900,000 that's earmarked for that could be spent on something else. There was an alternative to a bypass that, that was between New Hogan Dam Road and Lime Creek Road. That, that There's about a mile that needs to be paved there. If we could get a hold of the, the property owner there and buy an easement going through there and spend the money that way and, and pave that mile, then it's going to alleviate a lot of the traffic here. I think that may be the best alternative to this street light if, for a time being. But to put it in and then put a bypass in, it, it just doesn't seem right to me. The problem on Daphne Street that Gary alluded to um, was a very real problem. And we had some pretty upset um, citizens who didn't know exactly what that park project was about and didn't know that it was happening the following Monday. It was going to be, the construction was going to be started. I've uh, spoken with Jonathan Miller, who is one of the um, engineers at Public Works, um, several times since that um, incident. And I've asked him to please forward me all proposed projects in District 1, San Andreas, Valley Springs, Wallace, Burson, La Pretenda, wherever it is, Manch, South Comanche, to forward me those proposed projects because when you bring the public in early enough, you're going to avoid a lot of that um, discontent and, and anger feelings. As far as the, the traffic light here in Valley Springs, I just hate to see that happen. I belong to the, uh, the uh, um, Valley Springs Area Business Association, and, and an offshoot of that group is called the Valley Springs Business Association Visionary Council. And that's a group of business people we've been meeting for some time now to actually create a vision for what the business community might look like and where it might be. And part of that vision is to revitalize what is our historic district. I mean, we really do have one. <laughs> it's right um, where Highway 26 and 12 come together. Now, if we put a stoplight there, what do you think that will do to our historic district? It's going to just ruin it. The idea of, um, I happen to be um, one of the, uh, I have to be president of San Andreas Merchants in San Andreas, I'll just quickly give you some background on that. We've applied for a, a mobility grant and we've received it and we just had a meeting yesterday that is showing us planning and vision of what San Andreas might look like with the correct planning and, and with um, all of this going on and the same thing is likely to happen here because the Valley, the Valley Springs Planning Group have also applied for a grant, received it, of $250,000. So my point is, back to planning. If we 
knee-jerk knee react to things like this without thinking about the future, how it's going to affect us, and, and we foreclose opportunities that we might otherwise have. So I don't know, I'm really a little scared about this traffic light and how far along in the pipeline it is. We need to know way ahead of time, we need to know years ahead of time when these projects are about to happen so we can have public meetings and public input and have some visioning and get the get the community on board because otherwise we end up like we did on Daphne Street with a lot of unhappy citizens who feel that that was the wrong project on the the right project on the wrong street if you will so um, to answer the question in short no I, I would prefer not to have the stop light well, let's take about 10, 15 minutes. There's some refreshments over there. And uh, please put your questions in the box, and I'll gather them up in about five minutes, and uh, we'll go with the second half of the program. <laughs> Cheryl, the uh, question from the audience is, would you continue funding Calaveras Public Transit or would you work to eliminate this program? I uh, happen to support public transit. I think it uh, says a lot about our community that we um, can offer public transit, especially, especially nowadays when gas prices are so high. Um, it's a way that... that uh, that we can help people that can't afford to, to drive their cars. Plus, you know, if you want to look at it on the environmental side, it, it um, is one less car on the road if one person, one more person takes the transit. Um, yeah, yes, I do. Question again, please. Would you continue funding Calaveras Public Transit, or would you work to eliminate this program? I would continue to fund it. I am in favor of it. Um, I think it's wonderful here in this county that you can call the bus transit over there, and they will come and pick you up in front of your house. There's a lot, a lot of counties or cities that will do that. They will take you to your destination, they will pick you up, and they will deliver you back in front of your house for a very small fee. And I think economic times that we're seeing now and in, in coming, that we're gonna see a lot more people um, using the transit, uh, the public transit. Um, there are seniors out there that are really struggling uh, with, with fixed incomes, or even people that have lost their jobs that need to get around, that can't afford gas. And uh, they are the ones that are being, they're gonna be using this the transit very, very much, I think, in the coming times, at least in the next year or so. Okay, Gary. Next question is, we have thousands of people here and no place to shop. Will you try to get some good stores here? We now have to drive to Stockton every month to shop. New businesses would also bring jobs and new taxes to our county. Yes, um, I'm in favor of the, the project down here and have been in favor on New Hogan, Nam Road, and Highway 26. Um, that's a new shopping center going in. It was approved by the Planning Commission recently with some conditions on it, and it has some problems to go through with Caltrans and work out some problems there. But I think it's a viable project. Um, I think it's going to provide competition with, with Marvell here. They have an anchor store. I believe it's S-Mart um, or a Safeway going in there. Um, it will provide jobs for local kids, um, a lot of management. There will be some management jobs in there. Uh, but it will give some place for our kids to go to work when they graduate since there's no college campus here. And Delta College campus has uh, decided to build even further away um, to Mountain House, so it's, and they abandoned the Lodi pro a project that they walked away from $4 million. So we do need some place for our kids to graduate and at least come to work and work in the county and stay in the county and learn how to work. I think I, uh, 
talked about this a little bit earlier, but as a business person here for the last 24 years, absolutely, we need more uh, retail. Um, I think about this a lot. You know, what do I go out of Calaveras County for to shop for? And um, I'm pretty loyal to shopping local here in here in San Andreas. I I uh, I don't I don't go out of county unless I need shoes, clothes, or basketballs or something that you can't get here. But um, yes, I would be in favor of it for some of the same reasons Gary was talking about. It brings more jobs um, and uh, and keeping our tax dollars here in the county to support some of the services that, that, that we're deficient in. We have a couple questions on Trinitas. I just have a question. What is, what is your, your stand on big boxes? Uh, go ahead. I don't see that in the questions so oh, far tonight. So. Okay. Okay. On big box stores? Yes. Um, <clears throat> And realistically, I don't see a big box store, if you're talking about a Walmart type store, I don't see a big box store coming to, to Calaveras County um, because of demographics and other things. But I think that um, encouraging the small businesses that we have and encouraging more businesses to come. I mean, we need things like office supplies, shoes, clothes, um, auto parts, there's a lot of, of goods and services that, that, that the people of this county really need and want. And I, and I know that the business community is not threatened by that. We welcome that because it'll keep you in the county and it'll keep you, maybe you'll come to my store to purchase your books or whatever you want to get. Gary, would you also take a minute to talk about big box stores? I, I don't think you're going to see a big box store here anytime soon at all in, in this county, uh, simply because of the fact that there's one in Jackson, and when they built that one in Jackson, they put it on the map and they drew a circle around it and said, this is the area it's going to be drawn from, this is the amount of people in this area, it'll work for us. If they put one here in the lower county, then they're going to be drawing away from that area over there if they're a Walmart. And, uh, a Costco, I don't think demographically wise the amount of people here in this county or the draw will, will have them even look at us. Uh, we would have to grow quite a bit. Typically those type of stores go in, in incorporated areas. We only have one city here in the county that's incorporated. Why do they go into incorporated areas? Because most incorporated areas say we're open for business, we're going to be growing, we're expanding, we're annexing property, we're, we're building subdivisions. Um, we're open for commercial um, endeavors. Um, that uh, that's what they look for, and they look for the number of residences and the number of people that could draw to their store. Uh, the other part of the county has to Wallamy County over there in Sonora, where another Walmart is. There's a possibility someday that a Target might come as a competitor. Now, if you consider Target a big box store. Um, some people don't because a lot of targets aren't real big. Um, as a competitor to Walmart, they may have an idea to come into it, into Calaveras County, but again, they're going to look at where they draw out, whether it's an incorporated area or not, and, and the amount of people in the circle that they draw. That's how they operate. Gary, the next question is concerned Trinitas. Please express your viewpoint and opinion on the Trinitas project. And then a similar question is, please give us some idea how you as a supervisor would approach making a decision on the project. Many impacts and issues would be involved, including the impact on the aquifer and surrounding wells, long-term water supply, roads and traffic, compatibility with agriculture, natural resources, land and rural, <laughs> and whether it is growing, growth inducing. And my minute is up. So, go ahead and give us an idea on how you would approach the decision-making project, the decision-making on this project, and your viewpoint and opinions. Excuse me. We we touched that earlier at my viewpoints on Trinitas. Um, <clears throat> like I said earlier, um, I, I think. The Trinitas is a very emotional um, issue here in the county. Um, 
the EIR, the draft EIR out is, is, is been out. The public comment period is closed. People have, have had uh, their say in it. Um, I was talking to one of the supervisors today and the responses that they've got um, on this project has overwhelmed them up there at the county. So it's going to be a while for them to go through and see them and look at them and sort them out uh, before anything happens. Um, like I said earlier, the Planning Commission has scheduled on November 6th to go out there and, and uh, view it and see it. Uh, whether it's when it comes up on their um, agenda, I think it'll be a while because of the overwhelming uh, response that was given by a lot of people. And I commend everybody. I commend anybody and everybody that wrote a letter one way or another on that project. Um, that's great community involvement. Um, but as far as my views on it, I, I touched earlier, if, if I'm sitting on the Board of Supervisors and it comes to me, um, I would look for uh, attorneys and lawyers to give us the best knowledge that we can have on that project as far as land uses and where it's at and how it got to where it's at and listen to their legal opinions on it and, and make a judgment based on that and public opinion. Some of the recommendations in the revised draft EIR are pretty stiff. We're talking about closing one of the wells, bringing surface water to water the golf course. We're talking about turn lanes on 26 and Highway 12. We're talking about um, some other things, and I can't recall right at the moment. But um, I would like to see because one of the biggest issues with Trinitas is water, the, use, the water use, I would really love to see some more testing done on, on, on that regard. So those answers can actually be, those questions can actually be answered. It's kind of left up in the air right now. I've been um, hesitant to, to get too, too involved with this because I hope to have the opportunity to be on the Board of Supervisors and I don't believe that it's proper to vote in public before you have all of the information. Because if I vote now, what am I going to vote on next time that I don't have all the information? So I hope that's a, a good answer. <laughs> Next question, do you have any opinions on how to resolve the issues of lots that will not pass current PERC testing? Well, I, I suppose it would depend on where they are. I think the goal ultimately would be to bring um, public water and sewer to, to um, areas at least that, that are contiguous to our water and sewer districts. Um, I think the county is shying away or, or moving away from wanting to use septic tanks. I know in San Andreas, we had a situation recently where a house got all the way through the planning commission, I mean, all the way through the whole process and was ready, they were ready to move in and discovered they didn't have a sewer. They didn't have any sewer hookup. <laughs> I was, I happened to have an extra one in town and they asked me if they could use mine or buy it and I was willing to let them use it, but, but what happened, yeah, I have, I have a few extra servers, but um, what happened was that they were told that they would have to put in a $30,000 septic system and when an EDU, which is a sewer hookup, came available, they would then have to buy a sewer hookup and abandon their septic tank. So I think these are issues that, um, that are, are a big one. Um, like I said, it, it, without the whole question knowing where this lot is, if it's in town or if it's out, out in the country somewhere, um, it would depend on what the circumstances were. What, what would I do about perk tests if they don't? Do you have any opinions on how to resolve the issues of lots that will not pass current PERC testing? 
Well, I think there's some engineering, some engineered septic tanks out there that are available for that type of situation. Um, there's also the fact that I don't know where the lot is or what you're talking about. Um, where, what possibly is the problem, like there's Zero was saying to where it's at, but there are some engineered septic tanks out there and they're getting very, very good at them, at building them, that just for those certain um, instances like that. Um, also, I want to bring up the fact that the CCWD, um, not knowing where the slot is, but CCWD has received some money to develop surface water to the lower part of the county. And along with that, they're talking about laying sewer pipe at the same time they're going to start laying that, that surface water pipe. So there is some infrastructure projects on the books as far as CCWD goes to get some surface water down here in the lower area of the county with some of the lots in the Wallace area that are dry and, and have no water. And those people are being forced to go two or three times a week to all the way down near the county dump to get to fill their water tanks and bring them back so they have water at their houses for not only their sows but their livestock. Um, so there are there are projects going that way and, and, and we are looking at, CCWD is looking at ways to bring so, uh, some of those uh, 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 infrastructure to the lower part of the county. Nick, if I may, I was referencing Rancho Calaveras. There's hundreds of lots in that one subdivision that don't perk. Mm -hmm. Not just one lot. That was one lot versus hundreds of lots that you're saying. Yeah, and, and they already have water. Yeah, they're serviced by CCWD water. Yeah. That's right. Yes. But there are there are some septic systems out there that, that, that are designed. You're, you're saying no, but uh, yeah, yeah, and you, yeah. you must have one of the lots. So well, you're, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, next question. Both candidates are for some form of continuing education. How would you achieve this goal, and how is your plan better than your rivals? Well, I've been involved. I don't know what my rival's plan is. Um, this is one subject that we have touched on a little bit over the course of the last four or five or six months. Um, but, I, and, I, and I can't speak for her, I'll speak for myself. I've been actively involved in, with a couple, several people, um, of, dealing with Delta College and getting a campus here, a satellite campus here in the Valley Springs area. Um, I've went to a couple of their board meetings. Um, we've, we've got um, a five acres that is going to be donated for them, a uh, campus, satellite campus for them, along with some portables that have been um, secured nine portables and um, a portable uh, restroom facility for men and women. Um, initially, Delta College said a five-acre parcel would not be big enough for them, that they, you cannot open a campus uh, on a five-acre parcel. However, we found a couple of city colleges that had satellite campuses that did have five acres uh, campuses, and they did have portables set up on them, and they were functioning campuses, and they were educating kids and people, not only day classes, but night classes. And um, we, so we approached, we are in the process of approaching back to Delta College and presenting in our findings as far as that type of campus and the feasibility of it. Um, we're also looking into to giving them the total cost um, to set up that campus and what it would take to facilitate it. Um, my personal feelings aren't a thing that, that as far as Delta College goes. And by the way, we do have two local candidates that are running for a board, uh, a seat on that board um, here in Calgary County. Uh, but my personal feeling is it was one of three things with Delta College. Since we are paying for it through Measure L bonds, um, in the campus, like I touched earlier, is being built even further away than the campus that our kids have an opportunity to go to because we are in Delta College campus area. Is one, get us a satellite campus, help us get it and maintain it. Two, if you can't, then let's get them out of here. Let's get Yosemite School District in here, which has Columbia College, and see if we can't get them to put a satellite college here, and or also, um, get Sacramento involved in it too. Thank you.
I've also spoken to this before, and I am very much in favor of a Delta College campus. And Gary's right that we have been being taxed on this for years, so we deserve to have something from our tax dollars. A college campus would be um, a good job thing too, but from, from what I understand is that for every student you have in a college campus, you have one job that's made, and these are generally pretty good jobs. So it's a very positive thing. Um, we do have Delta College classes offered now at our local high school. Supervisor Walensky and Supervisor Claudino have been um, involved in this for some time and have been working on this also. And um, it's a good project if, if we can make it happen. Calaveras Unified has, uh, Gary alluded to the classrooms, Calaveras Unified is donating all of the old classrooms that, come, that are coming from Toyon Middle School when, when the new, the new building or buildings are going in there. So there are um, some really positive things about that. The only thing that I want to be sure of is that the taxpayer and the ratepayers are protected as we move through this process. Where is the best area in District 1 for an economic enterprise zone? Okay, in San Andreas, we have a, a spot that used to be called the Calaveras Cement Plant. And there's a lot of infrastructure there already. It's not used at all right now, and it's sort of a shame because it's uh, it, it would be a perfect place for, for some kind of in, industry, light industry or manufacturing. And right adjacent to that, we have a industrial park, if you will, that has been being developed for some time. Now this is another reason why our community plans are so important, because we can designate what part of our communities we want to 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 have light industrial manufacturing, where we want to designate those, where we want um, single family homes, where we want multifamily homes, where we want our business district. And in Valley Springs, uh, there's out on Paloma Road, out that way, there's some property that might be um, suitable for, for, for that purpose. <laughs> but again, that's why planning is so important. Because once you put something somewhere, you're not going to move it. So let's think about this before we do them and plan it out and, and, and then we'll have a, a positive outcome. Where is the best place in District 1 for Enterprise Zone? Correct. Um, I think the cement plant is very viable. There's infrastructure there. Um, and across the street where there is an industrial park going in, that, those, that's a viable place for the pie zone. Um, I, I think the area in the Toyon area where there are businesses right now, um, I think is a good place for a, an enterprise zone. Um, that's already an industrial park. That's already designated as such. Um, there's also a, a small area down here between Valley Springs and Wallace, or a person in Wallace that has a small industrial park going in, and a guy's done a tremendous amount of work down there. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but it's a floor company. Um, he has done, he's made that place just absolutely wonderful down there. Um, they haven't done anything with the building that burnt, um, but I think, I've looked at that several times. Um, I think it's viable to, to make that building back to what it was before it burned down. It's a, it's a CMU wall building, so I'm sure the structural integrity of it has not been damaged other than putting new joists and deck and roof on the thing. Um, but I think those are two, those are three viable places that we could initially start out at that have already have that type of industry going in them or have had it in, in the cement plant area up there, have had that and they're not going to be much of, of anything else other than high sores in the cement plant down there. Uh, if we could get industrial set up down there and clean it up and get it to look nice um, like the guys done down there in Wallace area, I think those are all viable, and I think that's the best way to go, and the best places for it. Thank you. Knowing that past practice is an indicator of future efforts, please tell us what you have already done to improve District 1. 
Well, I, I'm involved in, in uh, several things here in, in District 1. I, I'm involved in the uh, Valley Springs Area Business Association. I'm involved in the Wallace Burson Association uh, that we're doing a, a lot of things and have done a lot of things. Uh, we did the flags down on the 4th of July down here in the Wallace area where we dedicated, we had 100 flags and VFW flags and we dedicated those to uh, um, fallen soldiers. Um, we, I have, um, we are doing a pumpkin patch over here um, down to the DASA pumpkin patch down here at the Parker Ranch in, in Burson um, over the course, it starts Friday and it runs consecutive weekends through November 2nd. Um, I I've, I've gave them straw bells. As a matter of fact, we put together, today we were testing and we had a big audience out there at my shop because my shop made a pumpkin cannon. Um, it's a, it's a uh, air powered cannon and we went and we got some pumpkins and we put this thing together. We didn't know what we were doing, but we kind of looked on the web and kind of got what we thought and we kind of engineered this thing. And we were shooting it off today and, and we were shooting a couple hundred yards and we and pretty soon we had, it, we had an audience from people in the neighborhood walking by and watching us shoot this thing off. So we're gonna have this thing going over here and I hope everybody here can come out and see it or come out to this pumpkin patch. This is the first annual thing that's going on over here. Um, I'm involved in the West Calaveras County Rotary Club. Uh, and the Rotary, as everybody knows, does a lot of things, um, from picking up garbage on the highways to uh, awarding scholarships to kids in the local high schools. Um, I've been, I, we used to own, the, up till recently, the uh, uh, local feed store here in Burson, uh, out on South Worth Road. Uh, my wife, Denise, ran that for about three and a half, four years. And some of you that may have been customers there know her from there. Uh, we cater to local people here. We cater to a lot of the seniors uh, that couldn't, that were on fixed incomes yet still had animals and couldn't get there to, to, to pick it up themselves or they didn't have a pickup. So we did a lot of deliveries to them and we basically did it for nothing just so that they could keep their feet, keep their animals. And, um, that's, I've, been, I've been involved in my homeowners association since I've moved here. I've either been manager or co-manager, uh, financial secretary. I've paved the roads over there, and I've got a red card, Cheryl. A red card. Oh, a red card. Oh, he's a red card. That means stop. <laughs> <laughs> he could go on for forever. <laughs> Sounds like. I'm not going to go over everything again. I kind of outlined my my what I believe are my contributions to District 1 um, previously, but but I think um, for the last 27 years when my children were little, starting out in my, uh, with school and being involved um, up to here as you, you usually get when you're involved with your kids at school, and um, in the business community, um, President of San Andreas Merchants, and we've done we've done a lot in San Andreas. Uh, um, we talked a little bit about our mobility grant that we we applied for and received, and now we're in the process of actually seeing that come to fruition. In fact, next Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, I would love to see some people from Valley Springs attend our, our visioning workshop so you can see exactly what's possible for the, the Valley Springs area also. Four years ago, I got involved in planning because I see planning as one of the deficiencies that we have had in our county and some of the reasons why we're where we're at. And we've been working on our community plan. In fact, in November, we'll be bringing our final draft vision to the community. We've gone through the whole process, which has been a long one, and Valley Springs is in the process of doing that also right now with the community survey and other things. So we'll be bringing that to our community for final final visioning, and then on to the on to the um, consultants with Mentir and Associates, and hopefully to the board of supervisors for final approval. I don't know what it's like not to be involved in my communities. It seems that every time I just want to observe, I end up either leading it or <laughs> being a part of it, and I and I and I must love it because I keep doing it. But um, 
I ask you to just look at my record and you'll see what kind of a super advisor I'll be in the future by what I've done in the past. Thank you. The next question is, Pettinger Road is a disgrace. Why was Milton Road recently paved and Pettinger left to fall apart? Well, I've commented on this before. We have 689 miles of road in Calaveras County and we have a budget, we've had a budget that has been inadequate to be able to address all of the issues. Um, I'm not privy to the decision making in the Public Works Department, but I'm assuming that, that maybe there were a little more squeaky wheels or there were, there were um, um, it was on a priority list. I just found out this evening that Public Works received, is going to be receiving close to a billion dollars, is that right? I think a billion dollars over the next 10 years, which is good news because we'll be able to address some of these issues. And that's another reason why we need to get back and we need to find out what are the projects in the pipeline right now so we can bring them to the public and have the public be part of the process. I think that's one of the reasons why there's, there's disillusionment in the public about our government is because we feel powerless because what we say and what we do is ignored sometimes or we feel that it's ignored and that needs to change. We need to have leaders that are willing to listen to the people and willing to truly hear what they have to say and consider their feelings in, in all decision making. Well, you know, I, I can't answer the question why, why Milton Road was paved. That's, that's District 5, Russ Thomas is, is a supervisor in that area. Um, and I can't answer the fact that a lot of people may not know, Zero probably knows, because she lives that way, that there's a road up Highway 49 between Angel's Camp that's in this district, between San Andreas and Angel's Camp that's actually in this district, called Fourth Crossing Road. It was just recently paved too, and it was in a lot better shape than Pettinger Road was, or is now. Um, and coincidentally, Pettinger Road, when I sat on the grand jury in 2005-2006, we wrote a report on Pettinger Road, and part of the report was it was part encased in the fact that we were doing a report on school buses um, and their routes and their main maintenance on them here in the county. And it all we wrote down that we had a member, a couple members, ride down that school bus route that went down Pettinger Road, and at that time. Um, the school board was not was not going to let the buses travel on that road simply because of the maintenance cost that it was costing for them to travel that road. Not only uh, the, the 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 bouncing of, of the the undercarriage of the buses, um, but the shoulders of that road are so sharp it was tearing up tires. There's no place it's unsafe. There's no place on that road for the bus to pull off in the mornings to pick up the kids um, and, the, and, and the amount of traffic that's traveling there because people coming from Rancho and, and the Valley Springs area cut across there to go over to uh, Highway 12. Um, but it, it is the number one thing when I'm elected supervisor, that's one of the other things when it comes to public works and, and road maintenance in my district, I will push to get that road paved and taken care of. And a turn lane. And a turn lane. <laughs> because that road is absolutely untravelable. Um, now, now over here at, at Olive Orchard Road, um, the developer there has an agreement when he starts selling a lot of those lots that he will resurface that entire road. I know that he's only done in part of his project, in front of his project, but it isn't an agreement with him to take care of that whole road. So that's going to be on him, not on the county. But Pettinger Road. I'm with you on that and have been with you for a number of years to get that thing paid. Should those who supported the bailout be re-elected? <laughs> um, um, I'm not sure I'm up on it. What bailout? <laughs> Should they be re-elected? Re um, I don't... <laughs> The ones that supported the bailout would would they should they be elected? No. I agree.
agree. <laughs> we agree on something. I'd just like to quickly answer his question about the Frico City Road, um, because I was wondering the same thing. But bec the Fourth Crossing Road, um, which is actually the Frico City Road, too. But um, because of there's because of the uh, group home that's up at Frico City, they've been told not to use the Calaveritas Road and. I want to look into this because I want to say I hope that they're paying for that resurfacing because the reason they they have that is because of all the moms and dads that come to visit their their children up there. <laughs> and the delivery truck. The two of you sound a lot alike tonight. You must disagree on some issues. To help us understand better, please answer the question, which current supervisor do you most agree with? Well, that's a, it is a very difficult question because I, I um, don't want to avoid it, but there are times when I agree with Tom Tryon. <laughs> there are times when, um, over, the, over the issue at, at uh, Lake Tulloch, when the Lake Tulloch Alliance didn't want them to build out over the lake. I agreed with Russ Thomas. He came out in the audience and actually made a pitch as if he were a, a citizen. I agree with Marita, Marita because I believe, she says she's been waiting 10 years to get an oak ordinance. I can't figure out how, why it takes so long, but I agree with, we need one. Bill Claudino, Bill Claudino's kind of black and white sometimes, and, and I find myself believing that rules are rules, laws are laws, ordinances are ordinances, and policies are policies. Who have I forgot? Steve. Oh, Steve Walensky. Yeah. There's many times when I believe when I when I agree with Steve also. I can't think of a of a, of a particular at this moment, but uh, Union rep. Uh, union rep? I don't know much about <laughs> any activities in, in that regard. Which, which supervisor, current supervisor, do I mostly agree with? Is that the question? Which current supervisor do you most agree with? I most agree with. I most agree with all of them. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I do have, like I said earlier, I do have two of the current supervisors um, supporting me. Um, I, I, I don't... I have not had an opportunity to work with, with any of them, actually, on anything, um, but I am willing to work with all of them. Um, as far as agreeing with all of them, I'm, I'm like zero. I agree. There's some points that I agree with that they stand, and there's some points that I don't. Uh, I think that's part of being a supervisor, or even working with anybody. There's going to be times you disagree, and there's going to be times that you do agree. Um, but to take sides against people, like some of the things that are happening, I don't think um, I would be that way. I, I would look at each issue and each the merits on each issue when I make my decisions. Is it important that government operate openly, and why? Well, sure. It's 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 a, it's vital that the, the government open uh, works openly, um, and why? Uh, well, because I think we're all we're all citizens here. We're all live under the same sky. We're we're all people that 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 have the same ideas. Not may not be to have the same ideas, but we all have to live where we live. And uh, the government is 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 their main function is for public safety, as far as I'm concerned. And they're not. They're everything that they do should be open. Um, some matters can't be um, when it comes to litigation they go on, or, or, or um, personnel matters because of legalities in it. Um, but everything else, yes, it should be wide open. Everybody should know everything, every step of the way, what's going on. Um, they should be able to go up to the county at any department and ask for any piece of paperwork that they like. Uh, and they should be given it to them. They should have, um, they should, people given it to them should be cordial. Um, they should give it to them with a smile because they work for the taxpayers. We are taxpayers, and even those people that work there are taxpayers. 
Um, they get taxes taken out of their checks too. But yes, it should be very open and that's, that's the way it should operate all the time. I've been an advocate for transparency in government since I started this campaign. Um, Gary talked about being able to go in and get uh, got documents, absolutely, but I think I'd go a step further and say all public documents should be online. So you can, you can go online and get whatever you want and, and let those hardworking people at our county level do their job and get be more productive at that level instead of having to deal with us at the counter. Now, if we have a question about a document, absolutely. Was the question, and why? Is it important the government operate openly, and why? Well, because that, that's where you, you get, um, you gain the public trust. If, if there are questions about why a supervisor is doing something, there shouldn't be a question, really, because because what 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 your public officials are doing should be above and aboard. There should be no backroom deals going on. There should be no threatening of of, um, of employees ever. We should be able to have a government that that we can trust and we don't get frustrated with because. We don't think our opinion counts, and we need to work harder as as leaders, whatever whatever thing we lead, to 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 ensure that the public trusts us. And we need to build that that kind of uh, confidence in, in our in our um, citizens about our, our public officials and our government. The county has used the same auditor for a number of years. Do you think this is time to get a different auditor, and why? When I served on the grand jury for two years and one as its four person, that question came up um, back back in the day. Um, there's something to be said about having an auditor do the same work for a few years because it doesn't take as long. For, they're familiar with it, but there's something to be said too about becoming too familiar. Too familiar with the employees that you're working with, too familiar with um, the facts and figures. On Calaveras Unified School District Board, we have the same um, issues, but I think that, not that we keep the same auditor forever, but, but there are all those two sides. But I think ultimately, yes, we need to change auditors because, because they, they get to know people, they, people you know, people get to know each other. There, there becomes a comfort zone that I don't think is necessarily healthy in, in um, county government. We tackled this issue recently um, with, with the auditor that audits the books. Uh, the current auditor, BBNR, had done the work for five years previously. They had a five-year, actually they had a three-year contract, a two-year contract, and then a three-year contract um, that that they did the books. We we went and solicited bids uh, for a new auditor, and, and this is what happened. Um, we found a new auditor that would do the books for about 60% of what the the other bid that we got from BBNR. We sent out nine, nine RFIs for asking for quotes and we only got two back. One was for the one that was currently doing it and one for a company that was down south. We selected to go with the one down south because it was about 60% or 40% less of what the bid was for the other one. And we felt that five years was long enough for, for one company to continuously do the books and audit. Um, so we hired this well, we, we recommended, we went before the Board of Supervisors with our recommendations and our findings and the RFIs that we came out, that we got. And the Board of Supervisors issued a minute order um, for the, the CAO to enter into a contract with this other firm. The CAO never did it. 
guy's name was Tom Mitchell. I don't know if people were familiar with him. Um, he never did it. He was subsequently left. He, he resigned and left office. Nobody knew about it. It was supposed to be a done deal. It got time to where the county auditor, Linda Churches, felt that there should be an, an entrance interview, what they call an entrance interview, where the auditor comes and puts down what he wants the, the auditors or the, the county auditor, the paperwork that they want and how they're going to do the audit. And so everybody's on the same page. She starts getting together what paperwork he needs to look at the books and what he's going to look at. No call came. So she called down there to ask the guy what's going on, how come they got contacted her. He said they had no contract. So it was a shock to everybody. Then he said that their price was going to go up and they wouldn't do the books. So we eventually had to go back to BB&R and go back to their original bid. We're actually paying 40% more this year than we would have had to pay the contract for the life of the contract was a three-year contract and it was like 40% each year over the course of three years. So I don't know where they're at right now because the grand jury actually solicits those and brings them to the Board of Supervisor, but I do know that's what happened this year. That was my question. <laughs> Marilyn, good question. Should there be a penalty for somebody not following through in government position when they do not act on what was given out as far as the order and the directive? You couldn't penalize Tom Mitchell, no. Well, so Tom, in your it, opinion, that, that was the CAO, and certainly it would warrant some type of, of uh, personnel um, behind closed doors, a closed session on dis discretion. Um, what is determined between the five super boards advisors to do with it, sure. I'm sure there would be a big discussion if Tom Mitchell was, was still there on what had happened. Absolutely. Do you want to answer that question? Or? Yeah. You know, um, I guess I'm used to the way uh, Calvary Unified works. You know, the board sets policy. We say we create the vision with the superintendent. We are liaisons with the community. And we hold the superintendent accountable when things aren't followed through. I think that there needs to be some changes at the county level in the same regard. The Board of Supervisors should have held, <laughs> should have held uh, Mr. Mitchell accountable. I know he's gone, so we can't really do much. But, but in the future, um, supervisors should not be micromanaging departments. They shouldn't be intimidating personnel in any way. They're responsible for hiring a, a, a CAO and supervising that CAO. And the lines really need to be clear. Not that the supervisors aren't interested or watching what's going on, but in this particular case, it sounds to me like they should be held, in, they sh that the Board of Supervisors should be taking some uh, responsibility for this. I'm going to go with a couple more questions here. Please explain your position on future growth for the Valley Springs area. Well, I think we've touched on, on this a few times tonight, but it's worth it's worthy of talking some more about it. Um, growth is coming to, to Valley Springs. Growth is coming to Calaveras County, and unless we put a lock on the gate the, on the road as, as people enter and, and let them in or not let them in, we don't have a lot of power over how many people move here or um, want to start businesses here, that kind of thing, and I don't think we should. Um, I think Valley Springs is going to grow. I think. Believe it or not, I think San Andreas is going to grow in a positive way, too. I think Calaveras County is going to grow. But that's why I, I'm pounding so much on having a vision, having plans put in place. So, so not that we want to control anything, but so we have, so, we, so, our, so our communities are are designed the way the, the citizens want them designed. 
we we've already touched on the fact that we all want more retail we all want companies to come in to provide jobs and we can do it all and we can still we can still celebrate those things that we find special here in Calaveras County like our ruralness like our agriculture like our awesome recreation like our beautiful oak trees our timberlands we can still have all those things and all the things that we all love and why we live here and why we come why people come here and why why people return here and still grow because we don't have a choice of whether we grow we have a choice of 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 how we plan that growth I want to back up for just a moment on that last question. Tom Mitchell, when it was discovered, was already gone. He was long gone. So there, there was no accountability to be held to that guy because he was gone. And whether he knew what he did or not, I, I don't know. That's probably been known only to him at this point. So, so when it was discovered, he, he'd already been gone. Uh, as far as growth here um, in Valley Springs area, was that the question? Please explain your position on future growth for the Valley Springs area. Springs area. Um, I, I think with the, 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 the fact that we have very limited infrastructure, um, that we need to concentrate the growth in the areas, in infill areas, in compact community areas, to, to build the infrastructure, and then it will take off and go from there. Right, right now, we're, we're the, a lot of developments that we have were developed without any infrastructure. They were there's wells in the ground, there's septic tanks in the ground, there's lots that don't that don't perk, um, leaving them virtually useless. Um, we need to concentrate, like other communities and other counties, in, in growing our infrastructure by starting where we're at with infrastructure and building outwards with it. That's where the growth needs to occur. There's a lot of infill places here. There's a lot of places that, that need that, that we can expand on our, our infrastructure, and the developers will be willing to pay for that. It won't come out of tax dollars. It won't come out of mine and your dollars. It will come out of developers' pockets, and then further on down the line when they sell the lots or they sell the homes that they're developing. And that's how you get infrastructure, and that's how you start it and keep it going. That's what we need here. We need that type of thing going on. Then we can get retail establishments. We can get commercial establishments going in the county that we all want. We, with the price of gas, everybody that I talk to going to door to door doesn't want to go outside the county to, to, to go to work or, or go to buy things. They want to stay here locally and, and save money here. Last question for the night. It's a very general one. Why do you want to be District 1 supervisor? It has to be a tough job. It's going to be a very, very, very tough job in the coming times. I don't know if uh, everybody's aware, uh, they may be um, what Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger um, has called a, an emergency session uh, with the Senate and the Congress uh, to go over the, the recent shortfalls in the budget that they recently signed and trying to find out the, what ways they're going to cover those gaps in the budget. And one of the ways that's being proposed right now is take the money from counties in forms of property taxes. Right now, when you pay property tax on your property here in the county, the county does not get all of that property tax. It only gets a percentage of it. And they're talking about taking even that more of that percentage away from the county. If they do that, then there's going to be a big shortfall of funds here in the county. Um, that's, that's going to be a big problem that we're going to, a big hurdle that we're going to face next year. There's also building permits um, that we used to rely on here in the county over the last few years, of course, of the last five to seven years when, it, when construction was booming here in the residential development areas of the county. 
that we, we're experiencing and the permits going through the county right now at only about 20% of what went through last year. And that, and those that of that 20%, they're mostly remodels or decks or, or things of that nature. So they're not high dollar uh, permits that are going through. So the county's not getting a lot in their coifers from, from the permit division uh, or the fees. They actually don't get the permits that goes into the building department, but the fees that are associated with all of that that go into the general fund. So there's gonna be some big problems ahead. I, I'm aware of that as far as money in the county. Um, there's issues in the county facing us with Trinitas. There's issues facing us with Costco Creek. Um, there's a lot of issues going on right now. And it's gonna be a very tough job, but I think my background in business and my construction related uh, throughout my life and will help this county achieve where it needs to go and do the best that we can in the tough times we have ahead. That is one of the reasons why I want to do this job. I know that we have a lot of problems here. And I think with my experience that I've shared with you earlier, that I have the ability to work with people, bring people together to come up with solutions. I want to be part of the solution. And I'm not sure I know how not to be involved. It just seems like that's part of who I am. And I want to be, I care about Calaveras County. I've been here most of my life. And I want to see us be able to celebrate those things that make Calaveras County unique. And I want to see us grow, but I want to see us grow with, with a plan and a vision. And I think that I have what the values, the leadership, and the experience to to be the kind of supervisor that, that um, District 1 needs to have. My, as I said earlier, judge my ability to be your supervisor in the future by what I've done in the past. I'm not a passive, I'm not just a passive citizen. I'm, I'm action oriented and I believe in listening to the people, following the law, and public participation is, is a big part of where I come from. So I encourage the public to continue to participate because, because there's a lot of smart people out here in our community, in our county, in our district. And we, there's a question out there. Um, and I think that we need to, to, to listen to those people and get, get solutions from our public. Well, thank you very much. I know that all of you are going to vote on November 4th, if not before. We have some information in back, and if you know somebody who needs a voter registration form, we also have those in back. Thank you very much for uh, coming tonight.